now and uh, but he's very stable and uh, we're still doing our best to uh, make him well this indeed is another avoidable occupational hazard there is need to conduct a hazard risk assessment to identify these hazards to be able to know how to uh, uh, provide solution to it and to be able to also know if it's the environment we are working is the appropriate environment you're supposed to be working to be sure that they say that i should be preparing if he stay here for more for, for more than three months i should prepare for 1.3 million naira. so i'm begging nigerians that let them come to the aid of the the, the, the boy drugs has been prescribed that we can't afford we look up to to help not over yet as we are still tracking the story and reporting new developments to refresh your memory some of his family members suspect foul play while the agency says the blame is not theirs to take well what's new is that the autopsy result is out hakim jimo has the big reveal when 40-year-old Fatai Salami left home for work that fateful day, 20th of July 2020, nobody envisaged he would not return home. I spoke with him on the 19th of July. He was full of life. No sign of health history, no depression. A fleet manager, Fatai Salami, was said to have drank from a bottle of chemical substance suspected to be sniper in the premises of Ogun State Traffic Compliance and Enforcement Agency before he gave up the ghost in the hospital where he was rushed to. One of his trucks was impounded for contravening traffic laws of the land and was allegedly fined 270,000 naira, including the 50,000 naira demerage fee for the five days the truck parked in Trace office in Abeokuta. Fatai allegedly committed suicide out of frustration. After his appeal to trace officials to accept 150,000 naira he had, was rejected. Five weeks after, the result of the autopsy conducted by medical practitioners confirmed that the fleet manager actually drank some quantity of chemical substance which resulted to his death. With this result, the body of the deceased was released to his family for burial. Although his remains have been buried in Abeokuta, his family members and friends say they want justice to serve as deterrent to others. This is a fight for every other Nigerian who are equally calling all the human rights activists as well as every media office to please help us on this matter. Even this justice I'm telling you about is not as if it's going to bring Fatai to life again, but to to, to block all the future reoccurrence. The Public Relations Officer, Ogun State Traffic Compliance and Enforcement Agency, Babatunde Akimbi, comments. If that's what they want to do, we wish them well. The late Fatai Salami was born in 1980 into the family of Mr. and Mrs. Oseni Kendi Salami. He was the fifth child in the family of eight and father of three until his demise. He lived in Ijego, Lagos. Something tells me that the story is not over. We'll just wait and see. Now, a little over two months ago, a 22-year-old undergraduate, Uwa Omozwa, was raped and brutally attacked in a church in Benin City. She later died in hospital. News of the incident went global with individuals and groups calling for justice. Since then, we have stayed with the matter, and if former Okafo, who spent time with the family during the week, reports. Three months down the lane, we are here in the family compound of the late Owa to feel the pulse of her loved ones she left behind. It's not an easy experience. It's a difficult one because I did not plan it that way. She was growing up maturely and responsible to me and to the society before. But since then, I miss her dearly. She is still in the mortuary. We have not buried her. The police said we should write a letter to them by asking of copy of our autopsy or every test carried on her. I miss her dearly. It's not been very easy. The word I just used to console myself all the time is um, 
I always say, even if she's not here with us physically, but she will always remain in her heart. Agony. Tears still flow freely as the family say they wait for the reply to an application to the police for the release of the body of Hoa to enable them bury her. State Commissioner for Social Development and Gender Issues, Maria Edeko, who spoke via telephone, gave an insight on the developments. If we don't need such evidence, they now involve assuming the body again which is not encouraged but we like the police have demanded for written uh, application for the body to be released to the family we had so desire to bury the body of uh, our beloved daughter who are now i think it's an appropriate uh, process to write an application and if the commissioner of police in his wisdom believe that he's gathered enough evidence for them to secure conviction in the case they may release the body to the family for burial meanwhile the scene of the crime has remained closed investigation is still ongoing according to the police Owaila Omozuwa died on 30th of May this year, 2020, from injuries sustained after she was gang raped and killed in a church, which she used as a study center. Her death fueled national outrage. <laughs> this for Uwa is ongoing. The police will not stop until her killers are caught. Moving on, several editions ago, when we brought you the story of 24-year-old Shegun, not real name, who lost his memory following a car accident in Delta State, who were in search of his family. However, the update on Q suggested he may not have relatives in Nigeria after all. Austin Ademodu has the latest. <laughs> This is much improved Shegun looking more cheerful and welcoming. For the past two months, he has been under the care of the Federal Medical Center at Saba as he recovers from a memory loss following a heart injury in a car accident. The chief nursing officer in the world describes Shegun's condition as encouraging. Presently, I think to reasonable extent, he's improved. At least more than the way he came here. Interestingly, Shegu has won many friends, and one of them is this patient, Anthony Ijofo. He gives an insight on what he has so far found out about Shegu. Try to write down some things. I even have to buy a notebook to pick up some things that I may not remember, so that when I look at it, I can. He mentioned Ojao Dam to Ilaru. But among the towns that he did mention, this uh, Ojao Dam and Imashai. He said he has been to Imashai, he's close to Ilaru, he has been to Ojaldon, he's close to Ilaru. What it means is that I think uh, they go to Ilaru for work and go back to Ojaldon. When it seems a breakthrough is in sight, a new twist to the story emerged, is suggesting that Shigu might not be a Nigerian after all. A document in French language issued in 2018 has been found on him. We realize that the man, actually, young man is from Bene Republic from a place called uh, Pobe, P-O-B-E. That was what was written on the small document we actually found. For further clues, I met this young man from Ogo State who is familiar with young men and women crossing the borders into Nigeria for skid and many other jobs. They do think that they are expert on it, all this finishing work, P-O-P, hard work and all this stuff. Anywhere you see, they are trying to finish up the building. I mean, the good one, they are the one in charge. Luckily, I met one John, an architect from Togo, who has been in Nigeria for more than 14 years. All his workers here are either from Benin Republic or Togo, and none could recognize Shegu from the video I showed them. However, John volunteered to come along with me to the hospital to interact with Shegu in French language. As I'm Koton language, you know if you speak one, I 
come ask some French, you know if you speak. I ask him again, say, which village from Kotonu? Where you from? You know, as I come call four villages for them for Kotonu. You know, as anywhere. He just tell me, say, Yoruba. I want you buy the here. I say, if you be Yoruba, why take get that you are I think I would arrive in the public. Our boundaries are so porous. They can enter with any strategy. To the extent that they can even stay at the back of all these to combo cars, stay at behind trailer trucks, you know, still stay, stay, they can even hide inside the bag. My next port of call was the Nigerian Immigration Service, Asaba. With the state comptroller not willing to speak on camera, the Public Relations Unit assured me that until after investigation, Shegu for now can be classified as an irregular migrant. For now, Shigu still remains under the care of the Federal Medical Center, Saba, with support from good-spirited Nigerians. His full recovery from memory loss will no doubt be of great help. investigative reportage by Austin. Great job. And at this point, we're calling for possible lead towards finding his family members, even if they live outside the country. A few weeks ago, Newsline featured 14-year-old Princess Michael, who was allegedly abused by her guardian, Dickness Oyewoli, who is currently awaiting trial at the Medium Security Custodial Center in Kaduna. Let's join Achari Maxwell for an update. Thanks to the timely intervention of government and good-spirited individuals, Princess has recuperated discharged from the hospital, and now lives with her uncle, Bernard Megari, at Sabantasha in Chukunloka government area of Kaduna State. <laughs> Here, there is neither tears nor sorrow for Princess. Like the dutiful child that she is, Princess helps out with routine family chores and spare time too for the family poultry. And? I will tell them thank you, so that he helped me for hospital, he take care of me for hospital. Her uncle, though excited that she is mentally and physically stable, is however concerned that she has been out of school for too long. Hence, a lesson teacher was engaged to help out. I remember asking her, what does she, why is she interested in being a doctor? She said the doctors were very kind to her in the hospital, she wants to reciprocate. And her wounds are healing. Being that she's a little girl, her body is building up fast. So her wounds are healing more quickly. So we appreciate God for that. Princess has continued to receive care and attention. The letters courtesy of Kaduna State Government through the Commissioner of Humanitarian Services and Social Development, Hafsad Baba. Uh, in Kaduna State, uh, primary school and secondary school is compulsory and is free. So she, she can choose any of the um, boarding schools she, she likes uh, in Kaduna. And I'm sure she's going to get admission as soon as uh, she sits for her common entrance and pass. And uh, whatever assistance uh, we can give, we will do it as government of Kaduna State. Go, go, Princess walks and looks forward to school reopening. Her tormentor, Dikinesi Emi Awolola, at the other end, awaits a date at the magistrate court in Kaduna for continuation of hearing of her case. Her family is, however, exploring a plea bargain option. They are saying that they will take care of her, her educational needs from primary to tertiary, and uh, they want us to drop a particular charge which we are not in agreement on because the whole essence of plea bargain does not mean that the defendant will completely be exonerated from liability. They don't want the sentence of prison to be meted on her. They only want the options of fine. The particular um, offense, I mean charge they want us to drop is the section 222 where there is no option of fine. And we are saying that is the crux of this matter. The case comes up for hearing on Thursday amidst interest and high expectations. Pleasing to see Princess doing so well and thanks to her new guardians. Of course, more updates are coming on that one. 
Next up, providing qualitative education was why the founders set up Danny Joy International Schools for elementary pupils and to expand the academic scope to accommodate older children. The group has opened a secondary school right in the heart of Umwahia, the Abia State capital. Take a look. Since the year 2019, when it landed like an eagle, Danny Joy International Schools has been in the business of instilling unique and high-level standard of education comparable to international standards on its pupils. Now that it has expanded its frontiers with the addition of the secondary arm, the management says there is no going back on quality, standards, mission and vision. Giving the children here in Abia the opportunity of schooling within and closer home and not having to travel out to attain this quality and standard of education. So I think um, it's an honorable and it's a beautiful initiative. Our motto says honesty in learning. We have come to bring a new concept in education in this area of your state. And we are poised to do something wonderful that even future generations will be proud of. We believe here in Danny Joy that learning has to be not just fun but also interactive. Commissioning the secondary arm of Danny Joy International Schools, the senior minority leader and senator representing Abia South Interior Zone, Senator Enyinia Baribe, expressed satisfaction with the level of laboratory and the other teaching aids on grounds and admonished management to make the best of the faculties. Thank you, my good friend and brother. Uh, what is? There is no investment that anybody can do in this world. That is more than education. So I commend. Impressed by quality and progress made so far by the school, Abia State Commissioner for Trades and Investment and former Deputy Speaker, Abia House of Assembly. Honorable Cosmas Ndugwe eulogized management and urged prospective students to take advantage of what the school has to offer. This is a wonderful investment. Um, it's an academic cycle of learning. But now, I would say it's a complete cycle. Having the Captain Young, train nursery, primary, and uh, now secondary school. So it's a thing of joy. Danny Joy International Schools is situated at Onyerubi Close, off House of Assembly Road, right at the center of the city, Umahia, Abia State. Congratulations to Danny Joy Schools for the expansion. Now, Jack. Motels, manufacturers of Jack Automobile, has penetrated the Nigerian auto industry with its high performance, beautifully designed, and rugged TC pickups, SUVs, heavy duty trucks, and buses. Managing Director Eliza Day Jack Autoland Limited, Demola Adeojo, said the automobile company prides itself in its ability to produce quality and standard automobiles with emphasis on safety. Abolade Salami reports. With over 14 models of vehicles comprising five light duty trucks with a carrying capacity of one to five tons, one medium duty truck that has strength to transport 10 tons, three six pickups, one bus, five models of SUVs, and one sedan car, all operational in Nigeria. Elizabeth JAC Autoland Motors says this brand of automobiles have proved their worth as second to none in Nigeria. The T6 pickups that comes in three variants as 2x4, 4x4, and T6 extended has specific unique features that distinguishes it from others. This T6 is the only model in the market that comes with an extended version. And this is the area that is extended because the traditional bed of a pickup is only about 5 feet. While the T6 extended style itself in the class of convenience and comfort, with a 6 feet bed extension, auto brake system, 7 inch touch screen system, reverse camera, and a 6 gear selection 
It also has a 2.0 liter turbo engine for fast movement. In Nigeria, the mo one of the key things is the engine of a vehicle and the shock, the shock absorbers of a vehicle. Now, I t like I told you earlier, the engine is powerful. And because of the six gear selector system, it actually helps to preserve the longevity of the engine of the TC. So you can actually use the engine. If you use it and you service it properly, you can use this vehicle for even 10 years or more. The T6 is, um, with all the load, it still maintains its rigid stand, very solid stand, notwithstanding how much you put on it. So, and it will move well, it climbs very well, no matter what kind of terrain. The affordable T6 pickups, designed in both fuel and diesel engines, enjoy a distance of 207 millimeters from the ground. It's part of the vehicles that was deployed in the COVID-19 response as a, as a means of getting to all the nooks and crannies of Lagos State in terms of intervention. And definitely the vehicle's ruggedness and potential has showcased the company's immense faithfulness in the product. Um, so we've been using it now for about two years and we have it in different parts of the country as well. And our experience with it is that it's been extremely good. Um, both the vehicle itself as well as the after sales services uh, with the vehicle. So we've had absolute uh, excellent experience. Uh, I want to say that uh, it's a high quality product that is between of the Nigerian market. And uh, I'm so delighted and happy that such a product is within the Nigerian market and is also available at affordable prices. JSC Motors in fulfillment of Nigeria's auto policy assembled its vehicles in Nigeria. JAC Motors leading the pack. Let's go on a break now. See you shortly. And Kara shopping with the right place that one no fine. You know, nice no, it's too dull. Oh. This one. Oh wow, this it's beautiful. beautiful. Omo, this fabric. It's all fair though. Yeah. Look, make I tell you something. The new area Ankara, it go take good care of it. Ah. At the price, cheap, cheap. Try new area on Yankara and colors now. Your hogs are a comfy place for dropping in, for lazing around, and hanging out. So we've designed our hogs to be just as comfy, with a super absorbent core to lock wetness away and a soft, flexible waistband. Our most comfortable diaper keeps baby comfy at every angle. We'll never stop finding new ways to hug more like you. Huggies, your hugs inspire ours. to flatten the curve on COVID-19, just as you can help flatten the curve on corruption. Follow transparency, accountability, and integrity just as you follow health guidelines. Stay home with integrity and maintain your distance from corruption. 
just as we stay away from COVID-19 by maintaining social distance. Report every act of corruption to ICPC just as you report COVID-19 to NCDC. Stay away from corruption, stay safe from COVID-19. Report any act of corruption to ICPC on toll-free number 0800-2255-4272. This message is brought to you by ICPC and NTA. Breaking news or to interest sports lovers, Bayern Munich a few minutes ago has emerged champions of the 2019-2020 UEFA Champions League. The team defeated Paris Saint-Germain via a lone goal scored by Kingsley Coman in the finals played in Lisbon. This is the team's sixth Champions League trophy. On to the next, our favorite twins, Goodness and Mercy, who were born conjoined and successfully separated by a team of medical experts at the National Hospital Abuja, have clocked two. As promised, we are keeping tabs on them, and Hakim Ataliu, who is, who in my opinion, has become their nanny at large, reports. <laughs> Those dance steps are glimpsed from the merriment at the Martins residence in Maraba Nasara State, celebrating their twins. Goodness and Mercy are two. Goodness and Mercy marked their first birthday on the hospital bed, joined by the chest and abdomen, sharing vital organs before a successful separation surgery. Making this second birthday the first they would be celebrating, independent of each other. I remember two years ago exactly this period 2018 I was in deep sorrow the story a whole story was it was different altogether but today look at my babies very healthy and sound right from the beginning you people have been supporting us coming time to time to share goodness and mercy so I'm very very happy I'm not I'm, for my own for my mind I do not think that today we are, we are not in that a day like this will come to celebrate children uh, to celebrate goodness and mercy because what will pass through in the what will pass through for their bed I'm not think that we are going to celebrate goodness and mercy but as we are here today we thank God only few family members and friends graced the event we only have to say thank you to NCA and to the federal government at large who have in their own way has given us a massive support during the operations of those children. Even when we don't have much, federal government has done everything on our behalf. Amongst other wishes of the Martins is that COVID-19 will be curtailed as they long to enroll goodness and mercy in school in no distant time. The bed of co-joined babies is no longer news in Nigeria, with some dying after birth, some others during or after surgery. The success recorded in the case of the Ede Martins twins at the National Hospital Abuja and recently another case at the Federal Medical Center, Kefi, remains special testimonies of significant medical breakthrough in Nigeria. <laughs> The 
the twins are so cute. Happy birthday to them. The next story is very touching. Is it possible for a large-scale farmer to suddenly become a laborer in his own environment? One may think it impossible, but Mukhtar Abubakar was reports from the internally displaced persons camp in Shiroro local government area of Niger State shows that it happened. Like some of the internally displaced persons in Gwada camp, Ishaku Gamba and James Dodu left their homes, farms, holes and other farm implements behind to preserve their souls as bandits and kidnappers invaded and took over their communities. The duo were large-scale farmers who say back in their villages they produced varieties of food and cash crops in large quantity but are today laborers in their host community Gwada in Shiroro local government area. I plant about 15,000 tuba of yam, about 200 bags of maize, 60 bags of millet and 30 bags millet, of nuts. I work on farms as a laborer. I earn close to 2,000 naira daily. Their female counterparts back in their villages who were also farmers are basically not doing anything to survive but depending solely on donations. The situation is however different at the Kuta camp where the men are said to have returned to their farms not minding the security threat while the women remain at the camp doing menial jobs for their hosts to survive. They are soliciting support in kind by way of food and clothing, having exhausted the little they escaped with. Our husbands are braving the odds to go back and farm as well as sleep in the bush. We are suffering, no work to do, our children are crying of The issue of food it was last week that the food got finished. The responsibility entirely here is not supposed to be local government council only. With the present report, uh, I think uh, I, we will transmit this information immediately to the appropriate authority and uh, as usual, I, immediate relief will be availed. This situation, according to agriculturists, will negatively affect food production in the area, which in turn will also impact negatively on the social economic growth of the country. It is unpredictable. Hope fate smiles on internally displaced persons. Ever heard the term corporate beggars? Well, they parade the streets begging from members of the public, but their modus operandi is radically different from the average raggedy beggar. Daniel Adirie takes a look at the corporate beggar syndrome and the experiences of some Nigerians with this lot. As I'm talking to you, I have to go back to Abuja. And right now, as I'm talking to you now, all I have is just 200. So I need you to just help me with 10,800 naira. Let me complete it 11,000 and go back to Abuja by flight. When I get to Abuja, I'll remember you. I'm close to the president, Buhari. I will remember you. The current president, Yes. Buhari. Yeah, he's my man. Funny as this may seem, this is the reality of what goes on on streets in various parts of the country. Clad in fine corporate or native attires most of the time, you could mistake them for awkwardly mobile men and women in the corporate world or entrepreneurs. Their target? Unsuspecting individuals with flashy cars or those moving in and out of banking halls, particularly the ATM stands. And the purpose is solely to seek material or financial assistance. Dakwa is one of many Nigerians who are falling for the wits of one of these corporate beggars and shares his experience. It was all at the end of an evening program. A guy came in and after the service, he beckoned to one of the usher that he needed an assistant. And being the head of the welfare unit, I was called upon to attend to him. At about two weeks after, I was in my office in zone three. And I saw a guy, ah, this is the same guy because I remember him vividly, I was having his picture in my mind. I walked towards him and I asked him, ah, how are you? And ah, you don't know me, he said he doesn't know me. I said, ah, you, you are this also so person. And I explained the situation to him, I narrated the, the, I mean, the story exactly how it went. This guy denied. 
say he wasn't the one. He stays in Cardinal and at and that's come all the way from Cardinal for an interview year. And I was wondering how that concerned me. I mean, right. And then he told me he was like, yeah, after the um the interview he got stranded and couldn't go back and so he was trying he if I could help him with his Tife back home and this and that and that and I and all I was actually just keep reminding was how can you come out for um, all the way from Kagna and not plan your like Tife back home? Like I don't understand. He met me that anything that I can give him. So the first day that I met him I gave him something. The second time I still meet this man, I say, what's this man? The same story that you told me the first time. You are still saying the same story. You are not, you don't have problem. You are just using this one begging. Any man like you, you should go and look for a job. I met a guy, wear dress, and asked me uh, that guy, please help me with uh, um, social money that I wanted to go back home. I didn't have money. And I told him that, please, you, you as a man, you can help yourself. Not by coming to the road and beg for money. Noting that Nigerians are quick to respond to those who may seem in need and in desperate situations, security experts have noted that being security conscious of personal and immediate surroundings when approached by such people is key. They say some of these individuals usually have ulterior motives beyond just seeking financial or material aid. There's what we call the boiling frog syndrome where if you are not weary, you allow yourself to stay in an environment until the environment becomes too hot for you. So if you are not conscious and you allow someone to you know, lead you on, collect your information, then you are, you are falling into a victim of likelihood. So be conscious. So, the next time you are approached by a stranger in a nice corporate or native wear, stop, think and examine them because they just might be wolves in sheep clothing. Very sound advice. I hope you adhere to it. During the week, Nigerians from all walks of life, especially media practitioners, were thrown into mourning following the death of Malam Wada Meda, a media icon and chairman board of the news agency of Nigeria NAN. In this tribute, Timothy Yusuf talks about the man who contributed immensely to national development. What can we say? Uh, this is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody questions the timing of anybody's death. The late Wadameda paying tribute to his friend and contemporary, late Malam Isa Funtua, an elder statesman, veteran journalist and life patron of the International Press Institute and the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria a few weeks ago. Just about a month after, similar tribute is now being poured on him. The news of his demise sent shock waves across the nation as it meant a lot to many people across all divides. The doing of Nigerian journalism and longtime member of the global network of media executives for a free press show was a personality that influenced and shaped many lives. Kabiru Yusuf has associated with the late Wadameda for more than 30 years. He has always been an elder and a mentor to those of us who are in the profession, who are much younger than him. He was one of the people many of us looked up to. Another professional colleague and the director general of NTA, Yakubu Ibn Mohammed, described the deceased as a media icon par excellence. His death is a personal loss because we shared very many experiences, happy memories. And uh, he influenced me in more ways than one. Professionally, I was always looking up to Malam Wadamaida. He was a professional to the core. Apart from professional colleagues and contemporaries, top government officials cutting across all tiers spoke on the life and times of the distinguished journalist. He had a legacy of services that he has rendered to his motherland, Nigeria. He will be remembered by, first of all, his friends, because he has been a very great and true friend to so many people. He was a gentleman. He was a careful man. It's a huge loss to, to the media in the country. It's a huge loss to the nation. We all miss him. I think, I don't think he's ever held any other job outside this profession. Anybody who knows him will tell you this about him. He was quiet. He was very good to everyone that he came across. 
The demise of 70-year-old Wadameda, who until his death was also the member representing Nigeria on the executive board of the International Press Institute in Vienna, Austria, has indeed created a vacuum that will be hard to fill in the media industry. <laughs> A so rest in peace, amen. And this is where Newsline ends this week. Thanks a great deal for watching. I'll leave you with this. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Good night and God bless Nigeria. service of the NDA. There are individuals who thrive on impacting their society positively, doing good to their fellow human beings. For some others, they do not see it as a necessity. But when we come across those individuals who believe that it is important to their survival to impact others positively, we seek to celebrate them as we welcome you to another lovely time on Executive Discuss. I am Ololadi Adini Jadili. On this week's episode of the program, I have with me a philanthropist because he is somebody who is big on giving back to the society that has made him who he is. He is a grassroots politician, he is a journalist, he is an influencer. And of course, in his local domain, they refer to him as the president's man because he is one of the representatives of President Muhammad Buhari. Please join me as we welcome to Executive Discuss today, the Executive Director of the National Film and Video Census Board, Alaji Adidayo Thomas. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for bringing me on board. Thank you very much, too, for honoring our invitation.
Now, as I usually want to do with my guests, tell us your background. Where were you born? How, where did you grow? And what was it like for you starting off in life? Oh, well, uh, like you rightly said, my name is Adida Thomas. Patana Matana, I'm from Lagos State. Um, a true indigen on one side, Ologo on island, on the other side, Mafoluku Elemo Company, Oshodi, solo local government, Oshodi. Uh, well, I was uh, born by a technocrat, father, and of course, a business minded mother. Then back at Oshodi in 1967, I, I went to school. My primary school was in Lagos, Jewish Jew African Church Primary, Northern Primary School. That was directly opposite uh, Kalakuta Republic. Um, well, for secondary school, I attended two known, Olaluwa Muslim Grammar School, and of course, Abelkuta Grammar School. Olaluwa Muslim Grammar School is in Adwikiti. And, uh, the other one is in Abelkuta. I left for choir tech. Then it was choir tech. We had this last set of choir tech. And when I left for choir tech in 1985, 86, I finished in 88 in choir tech before proceeding to the University of Joss. We have my first degree, which happened to be theater arts. I left and I served in Marcord in 91, 92. Uh, before again proceeding to educationally to Nigerian Defense Academy where I had my masters. I did a couple of professional masters and diplomat from Cato Institutes in the US. Um, Atlas Economic Research Foundation also in the US. I, well, my background has been, I'll say I'm lucky uh, for having the kind of parents I have. On the other side, we have the disciplinar uh, disciplinarian who happened to be my father and look into what we do on a daily basis and things like that. Uh, and, and we have, as usual, the soft touch of mother who is equally in business. But when it comes to education and moral upbringing, the two of them don't, uh, don't take it lightly with us. So we grew knowing that. And that's one of the reasons why um, my parents did not send any one of us to secondary school in Lagos. So it's safe to say that the background you had has shaped you into the man you are today. You're right. I also know that um, you went to the, you attended the University of Joss where you studied theater arts. Maybe we should take it from there. That began your foray into the North because I know that um, today some people even see you as more of a Northerner than, you know, a Southerner. How did you get into politics? Uh, if I have to, we started when I was very young, but if I have to cut it, uh, uh, I'll pick it from Quartec. When I was in Quartec, then myself and some group of others too, um, we were always agitating for what is missing, what is lacking. So at a point, um, that goes on, on and on, on and on then, when, like joining a student union, and at the point, uh, it was generally, I think it was, I can't remember the government, they prescribed all student union, unionism. So what we did was, at that time, Nigeria was equally fighting for South Africa independent. So myself and a couple of others asked to form Youth Solidarity for South Africa in Nigeria, USAN. I think headed by Benga Olai Wipo. One time, yeah, one time PDP publicity secretary. Then I happened to be the vice when we were in Quartec. So it continued like that. Uh, from from that point, we went back to. I left in '88 to Joss, and I saw myself like, you know, having to because I confronted a lot of issues with the authority in when I was in Quartec. Um, but when I finished. When I got to just, I said, okay, let me concentrate on education. But I discovered that the student union generally has to even fish me out. So I concentrated in writing, bulletin, and we have to go into the dojo to go and be, you know, mm -hmm. press. There is nothing like computer whatsoever. We have to, 
uh, carry the pin by herself. So that took me far into University of just doing that on the ground. But immediately I finished, I couldn't even hold it. No, no, it's within me. So I have to join IPC International Press Center with um, Larry Arup that day, Tunde Aremu, and Co. So who were like that, agitating against military and doing Then I was the production editor. Um, from there, you know, initially when I was in school, I'd look at socialism, Marxist theory, and whatsoever. But having the opportunity of traveling abroad all the time and going to conferences like that, I discovered a couple of books, Bastiards, then read tip into Adam Smith and things like that. Now discover that, well, the present, the system we're operating is not actually like in Africa. It wasn't actually um, a socialist enclaves or communism enclave as we look at it. It's a different thing entirely. Africans are energetic and things like that. So I start encouraging people uh, to voice out in their own, no matter how little. Somebody took me on a social trip to one of the islands in Lagos um, under Amu Wadofin, thank you. So it took me there. The only government presence in that place was the only primary school built by uh, Ashwa Jubala Metinumbu. Aside from that, nothing again. There is no hospital, nothing, no good water. In fact, you couldn't even get to the island by road. So you have to get to under Papa Bridge, then you take a can. So, so people are living here, very terrible. So you see the woman, the humanitarian thing in me started coming out. So I sourced for money and I built the only primary air care center on that island. Although I'm not from a mode of I'm from Ushudi, but humanity is humanity. So I did that. And in most cases, people still come back to me to come and say, what do we do in this village? when there is election okay. so that they want me to tell them what which direction they should go I say, they have the freedom i'm not going to be there i'm going to be in Oshide. and at Oshide as well people start agitating i should contest okay so i well we ran into the primaries we were like party supreme i was asked to step down for my contending partner okay. that i did but then I have a strong affiliation with uh, General Buari ever since from the time he was military head of state. So it's like I've always been following with his reforms and activities. So by the time he came back into politics too, I, I had my tent with him. Everything that, that he fashioned either from the north or, you know. So I, I put it up my head up to, you know, the local government side. So that's how I kept on until the time my people said, you must contest, you must contest. And I was about contesting as well, the second phase. Mm. Then they dissolved the local government. Then I was made the one of the supervisory councillor in Oshudi Solo, local government. Your mother obviously had a lot of influence on you because even your name, you still take up her name, Aduke Thomas. Tell us about her. Ah, Aduke Thomas is a fantastic woman. May Almighty Allah grant her Aljana. Uh, she's a mother that even if there's another word, I'll prefer God to still give me that same mother. Um, not belittling my, mo my father. Uh, most, most children are tuned to their mothers. The fathers are the hard type, the strong one, the the correctional one, and things like that. So, but unknowingly, the thing flows. We're so close up to a point that it's always very difficult for me when she started getting hold to start looking into her face because I start having that premonition that one day I'm going to lose her. Um, she has a lot of influence, especially when it comes to charity. Okay. She might have her flaws, which I don't, I don't know, and I can't pinpoint any, but the issue there is I wish I can be like her in terms of, you know, um, charity, philanthropist, and human development. Even when I'm angry, 
she's the talisman. Yeah, she's the talisman. <laughs> they, they find a way of going to her and there's always a way she always calls me down. Hey, Dio, where are you? And things like that. We'll sit down, we'll eat and say, ah. then she'll start. Mm. That's something you are holding and I think I can collect it from you. And you know, studiously like that. Those things goes. And some friends too, uh, till they still call me a name. You see, I don't care because when I'm doing something or when they feel I'm angry and they pro probably want to appease me, and they just say, ah, I don't care. I don't. Immediately I hear that, that, soft that I soft better. And again, you see, in the social circle, when we're growing up, we have a lot of added out, Thomas, that or Thomas, and things like that. So when they're describing, because of her influence and her wealth, though, at that time, um, before she died, so when you're describing,